Hello everyone and good morning, good afternoon or good evening depending on where you're joining us from. Welcome to the Engineering for Change or E for C for short. Today we're very pleased to bring you the latest in E for C's 2014 webinar series. Today's webinar was developed in collaboration with Daniela Lantain from Tufts University. My name is Sean Fury and I will be moderating today's webinar. When I'm not doing this, I work for SCAT based in Switzerland, which is a consultancy, knowledge sharing organization, and project implementer. My main role is in the Secretariat of the Rural Water Supply Network, RWSN, a global network of over 6,000 practitioners in 140 countries. It's a great privilege to be hosting this webinar with our good friends at E4C. We also have our own webinar series happening every Tuesday on rainwater harvesting, water point mapping and groundwater research in Africa. So have a look at our website, rwsn.ch, to find out more. Now I'm going to move to the next slide, if it works. And I'd like to take a moment now to tell you a bit about today's webinar, WASH in Emergencies, Lessons Learned and the Way Forward. Water, sanitation and hygiene are critical needs worldwide and especially for populations affected by emergencies such as natural disasters, outbreaks and violence. WASH is a key focus area at E4C and we're focused on collecting and sharing information about commonly implemented emergency responses to treating drinking water and their successes and failures and lessons learned, as well as the potential new innovations to improve the quality of water and reduce the diarrheal disease burden in emergencies. As part of this effort, we're invited a expert in this field, Daniela Lantain, Assistant Professor in Civil and Environmental Engineering at Tufts University to share her research. I'm really interested in today's presentation because at SCAT and RWSN, we're generally working in development cooperation to achieve long-term goals. Humanitarian aid people are often different. It takes a different skill set and a different attitude to risk and success. But the two disciplines need each other. In Moldova and Rwanda, SCAT is patiently building infrastructure and capacity in the wake of emergency situations. But this can unravel at any time. In Ukraine, earlier this year, we had to abandon one of our project areas in the Crimea for very well publicized reasons. And earlier this year, I was in Liberia coaching government staff to write their first ever national wash sector performance report. That was completed just as Ebola crossed over from Guinea, and now everything we worked on is on hold and our Liberian colleagues live with day-to-day -day fear and uncertainty that has not been seen since the end of the war a decade ago. So much effort can be undone so quickly. So I have great respect for those who work in emergency response and I'm looking forward to learning through this webinar. We thank you for joining us today, but before we get rolling, I'd like to take a moment to recognize the coordinators of the EFC webinar series generally. Uh, Jana Aranda at uh, uh, ASME, Hori Schneider-Brown, Michael Maida and Steve Welch of IEEE, who work on developing and delivering the webinar series. Thanks, team. If anyone out there has any questions about the series or would like to make a recommendation for future topics and speakers, we invite you to contact them via the email address visible on the slide, uh, webinars at engineeringforchange.org. Before we move on to our presenter, we thought it would be a good idea to remind you about Engineering for Change, E4C, and who we are. E4C is a global community of over 770,000 people, such as engineers, technologists, representatives from NGOs, and social scientists, who work together to solve humanitarian challenges faced by underserved communities around the world today for such as uh, access to potable water, off-grid energy, effective healthcare, agriculture, sanitation, and others. We invite you to join E4C by becoming a member. E4C membership provides cost-free access to a growing inventory of field-tested solutions and related information from all the members of our coalition, 
including professional societies like ASME, IEEE, ASCE, SWE, and ASHRAE, as well as academic supporters such as MIT's DLAB, international development agencies like USAID, and Engineers Without Borders USA, Practical Action, as well as access to passionate and engaged community working to make people's lives better all over the world. Registration is easy and it's free, so check out our website, engineeringforchange.org, to learn more and to sign up. The webinar you're participating in today is one installment of Engineering for Change's webinar series. This free, publicly available series of online webinars shows cases the best practices and thinking of leaders in the field who bring innovative ideas and technology to bear on the global development challenges. Information on upcoming installments in the series, as well as archive videos of past presentations, can be found on the EFC webinars webpage uh, on the address here, engineeringforchange-webinars.org. If you're following us on Twitter, I'd also invite you to join the conversation with our dedicated hashtag, uh, hash EFC webinars. EFC's next webinar will be on the 18th of November at 11 a.m. EST with Alexander Pan, Program Coordinator for the Aspen Network of Development Entrepreneurs, along with a social venture from the ANDE uh, Network. Our topic will be Impact Inventing, Strengthening the Ecosystem for <clears throat> Invention-Based Entrepreneurship in Emerging Markets. Visit the EFC webinars page for registration details. If you're already an EFC member, we'll be sending you an invitation to the webinar directly. A few housekeeping items before we get started. On the screen you are now seeing, there are a number of different widgets on the dashboard at the bottom. The group chat is where you will interact with your fellow attendees and post any comments about the webinar. The Q&A widget allows you to submit any questions for the presenter. The help widget is for inquiries about any technical difficulties with resources on how to use the software and FAQs. Share this allows you to share the link to this webcast with your friends and colleagues to 13 popular social media sites. And the Twitter icon allows you to post directly to Twitter. And lastly, the survey icon allows you to take our survey at any time. I know this is a lot, so always feel free to hover over the icon for an explanation. So we've got quite a few people attending this webinar, so let's see where everyone is from today. Using the group chat, please type in your location. During the webinar, you can use the group chat to type any remarks you may have and interact with your fellow attendees. Don't forget to use the Q&A window to type in your questions for the presenter. If you encounter any troubles viewing or hearing the webinar, you may want to try uh, opening webcast, uh, webcast Elite in a different browser. Also feel free to access the help widget for technical help. Following the webinar, uh, to request a certificate of completion showing uh, one professional development hour, PDH, for this session, please follow the instructions on the top of our webpage. Uh, engineeringforchangewebinars.org. Also, please make sure to take a moment to fill out the short survey. Your opinions are invaluable to the webinar series. Without your comments and suggestions, the webinar series wouldn't be what it is today. So we've currently got around uh, 86 attendees and counting, which is uh, fantastic. And so here is today's presenter, Danielle Latain, who is the Assistant Professor in Civil Engineering at Tufts University. Uh, she has an environmental, she's an environmental engineer uh, who received her PhD in 2011 from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Uh, she completed her postdoctoral work at Harvard Center for International Development. Between her degrees, she worked at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, and over the past 14 years, she's provided technical assistance and evaluation of chlorination, filtration, and combined uh, treatment of household water uh, implementation in more than 50 countries 
both in development and emergency contexts. And she's published over 20 papers. So with no more ado, uh, I would like to hand over to, to Daniela to take us through her presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that introduction and for the opportunity to be here and, um, and to all the attendees. So just a reminder, if you'd like to ask questions, feel free to pop them into the q and I'll be looking at the Q&A and we'll all be reading through it as we, as we present. The timeline is it's approximately about a, a 25 to 30 minute presentation and there'll be 20 minutes for questions afterward. I'd actually like to start the presentation with a little bit of history on emergency response, which I generally find people aren't familiar with and gives a, a good grounding um, to people about how we, we implement in emergencies. So the emergency response principles actually come with the establishment of the, um, of the Red Cross. And the Red Cross was established when a particular um, individual, Henry Dunant, wrote a memory um, entitled A Memory of Solferino, where that described his experiences on a battlefield where he saw all of the wounded on the battlefield left without medical care. And he actually worked in 1863 to establish the, the predecessor of the International Committee for Red Cross. And their first goal was really to ameliorate the condition of the wounded in armies, to provide medical care, irrespective of which side someone on the conflict was, to, um, to people impacted, to soldiers impacted by war. The ICRC tenants were actually um, brought together into the first Geneva Convention, which was agreed to by 12 governments in 1864. The principles that ICRC started with are, are there's four key principles. The first one is humanity, that you work with the people who need you the most. So you, you go to the most effective, the people who need the most. Impartiality, that you work um, irrespective of what side of the conflict, what government, you work with all people who need you. Neutrality, you do not take a side in conflict. And independence, the emergency worker has the ability to make the decisions for themselves as to how to lead to the humanitarian, the humanity, impartiality, and neutrality principles. Now, ICRC also has as principles that they um, have within their own group, which are of voluntary nature, and the Red Crosses work together across the, the world. Now, to move on to the history of how we start doing emergency response, ICRC was actually crucial in establishing international law in the Geneva Conventions and after World War I and World War II, as we see the UN established. The the term NGO, non-governmental organization, was actually first used in the UN Charter, and organizations can apply to the UN to have what was called consultative status with the UN. So now there's approximately 3,000 NGOs that have consultative status with the UN. Now, during the Cold War, what happened is it was very difficult to respond to emergencies because of the international politics at the head of the UN level. So what would happen is that if an emergency happened in a country associated with the U.S., the U.S. might go in, and if an emergency happened in a country associated with the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union would go in. But it wasn't like we see today where, where the world responds to emergencies. At the end of the Cold War, what we saw was one of the benefits of the peace dividend was an option for really humanitarian aid to be a, a player, for, for humanitarian organizations to start responding to emergencies and to help. And just to give you a sense of, of the change, there were only 700 NGOs with consultative status at the UN in 1992, and now we have, have over 3,000. So there's really been a growth in this emergency response field. And so, so one of the things that I'd like to talk about when I talk about the history is that really emergency response as we know it has only been going on for 20 or 30 years. Really, it's a it's a relatively new field, and I think when people talk about you know how do we do emergency response, we need to keep that in mind that there's a lot of lessons we still need to learn because it's a new field. 
No, clearly there has been a lot of, of criticism of various humanitarian response activities, particularly in response to the Rwanda genocide, where um, the response itself was was actually assisted in continuing the war as some of the, the food and other aid that went in went straight to the militaries. There was some criticism in Rwanda of, of poorly treated cholera. And so the emergency response um, organizations got together after Rwanda to say we need to establish minimum standards for how we respond to emergencies. So when we look at our, our codes of conduct, um, it was actually Red Cross again that initiated the process to, to guard the standards of behavior. And again, this is voluntary. Um, this, it's voluntary for an NGO to sign on to this code of conduct for emergency response, but about 433 have. And, and they're based on the emergency response principles, but they also bring in some, some development principles, which are really about, um, about gender equality, about, about um, cost recovery, about long-term sustainability, things that we don't normally see in emergency response principles, which are to meet the needs of the most affected person. But we see more when we talk about development contexts, as, as Sean was mentioning, that link between emergency and development. Additionally, ICRC led um, the, the, the kind of group that established the SEER standards. And SEER is a handbook that establishes minimum standards and key indicators within um, four sectors, water and sanitation, nutrition and food provision, shelter, and health. And so, for example, these, an example standard is that each family should be provided with 15 liters of drinking water per day, right? And that's, that should be a minimum standard that we obtain, attain when we're providing emergency response activities. Now, these sphere standards, they're not actually evidence-based. They're not, they're not accepted formally by the United Nations, and, but they are really this kind of minimum standard that's used as a handbook across emergency response to say we as a group say we're going to do this and they're revised on a regular basis so the second sphere handbook just came out so as we move on so this is that's been really the history of how we do emergency response and what we have now is a whole set of organizations that specialize in responding to emergencies as they pop up and the type of emergencies that we respond to natural disasters um, such as earthquakes eruptions landslides tsunamis floods drought um, one thing to note is that really we see health impact we see epidemics after flooding. It's, it's really floods that cause health impact, particularly when the flood water stays, when the flood water doesn't immediately recede, when it stays in the homes and the people are really exposed to that flood water. We see, we see a lot of, um, of epidemics come up after that. We also see epidemics come up in response to disasters that cause mass displacement. So when people move, we see, we see a lot of health impacts come up. We don't see as many health impacts come up from other types of emergencies. A lot of times it's the initial trauma, like in an earthquake, the initial trauma, there might be health impacts, but things fairly quickly can recover back to normal after the initial trauma has, has been um, dealt with. Now, natural disasters are currently increasing, both in the amount of population that is affected because there's a lot more urban areas and unplanned settlements, and they're also increasing uh, due to climate change effects. Another type of emergency that we talk about um, is outbreaks. And so we're seeing, um, in particular with diarrheal disease, which we look at with uh, water sanitation and hygiene, we're seeing an increase in, in cholera, particularly in Africa. Something that's, that's very timely that we can talk about in the questions is, is Ebola that's uh, ongoing in, in West Africa and the, the role of WASH in that. Um, and the last type of emergency we talk about is actually something we define at the, at the United Nations level or by the donors, and that's what is called a complex emergency or a fragile state. And, and complex emergencies and fragile states aren't a specific event, but they're actually when the state cannot provide for its people. So, um, for example, uh, Somalia is a good example of, of a complex emergency or a fragile state where the emergency is, is more political and it's just there's a set of people who are affected by that. Um, there's a number of countries that fall into this. 
So as we move on, just I wanted to give some um, information on the increases in emergencies. You can see the graph on the left from 1975 to 2005. We do see an increase in the, in the number of natural disasters that are occurring each year. As mentioned before, we also see an increase in the affected population because these natural disasters are happening in areas where there's more population as well. And then on the right, I just wanted to talk a bit about the, the total population of concern to the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. And so this goes from 97 to 2006. And as you can see, the number of refugees, and refugees are defined as people who are affected by an emergency and then cross an international border in order to, to seek relief. And that number of refugees has actually stayed pretty constant, but the number of, of, of what we call IDPs, which are internally displaced persons, and so these are people impacted by an emergency that leave their home, but they don't cross an international border, right? And so they're within their own country, and, and that, um, that group is called internally displaced persons, and we've seen quite a, an increase recently, and, and this has continued since this graph, um, in the population of, of IDPs. Now, refugees are formally protected under international law. IDPs are not. The UN is formally responsible for refugees, but but IDPs actually, the responsibility still lies with their with their own government. And in the case where their own government may be part of the reason that they are internally displaced, there's a there's a gap in who provides services to these populations. So I just also wanted to list that humanitarian assistance. This is another chart showing that humanitarian assistance has, has really increased as well over time. And you see this with the end of the Cold War. There's, there's a great assistance. And this comes from both private and public donors. So one thing I do want to highlight is there tends to be a lot of alarmism after emergencies. And this is a this is a World Health Organization staff that after the Indian Ocean tsunami in 2005 stated that unless the necessary funds are urgently mobilized and coordinated in the field, we could see as many fatalities from diseases as we have seen from the actual disaster itself. And actually, in the tsunami, the water, the floodwaters came up, but then they receded quickly. And so we, we didn't see huge disease increases. We saw a lot of impact from the trauma, but we didn't see this follow-on disease. So I want to highlight that sometimes we, we don't need to be alarmists. We need to look at the evidence to see when things might be appropriate. And the other um, quote I wanted to put up is a quote um, from Deville de Goyer saying, another common myth about disasters is that the affected local population is helplessly waiting for the Western world to save it. Very honestly, especially with trauma, it's the first one to three days where, where people are being saved. And that's almost always exclusively done at the local level. And so uh, there's a sense of, of where is emergency response necessary and what is the local population doing that, that already that, that is very important. So to move on to talking a little bit about the populations, I had mentioned that refugees are formally protected by international law. Um, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees is responsible for these populations. And there's very good literature showing how to reduce um, crude mortality rate in refugee camps. And essentially, what you need to do in refugee camps is to provide food, provide safe water, provide vaccination, particularly measles vaccination, to provide health care and health information. And if you do those five things very quickly, the mortality rate will decline to background normal rates. Now, with IDPs, they're not formally protected by international law, and you tend to see high, high crude mortality rate due to an increase of background diseases. And, and we can see this right now in the Ebola-affected countries where you simply cannot get health care for normal, normal diseases such as malaria or childbirth. And so we're seeing these increased rates of background um, diseases it, such as um, such as malaria causing death instead of being treated, or childbirth where women can't get access to a C-section. We're seeing a lot more maternal mortality because the health system is, is shut down. Um, and then there's also a third type of population I haven't talked about, and those are the entrapped populations. And those are, those are people that are, that are stuck. 
they cannot move. And so a good example in the Western world of an entrapped population is, is people that were trapped in Hurricane Katrina due to the floodwaters either in the Superdome or in the roofs of their houses. Another example of an entrapped population is some of the populations in the Democratic Republic of Congo where there's quite a bit of violence and they're kind of trapped in their, their own rural communities. South Sudan is another example of, of where we see some entrapped populations. And there's very little known about their, their health needs, except we know that violence plays a large role in the, the health needs of these communities. So to move on to, to prevention in emergencies, we really do know what to do in refugee camps. When people go together in camps, we know what to do to keep them safe. And, and this, this concept is called, is called excess mortality. And so normally we want to keep the rate of death to be about 0.5 deaths per 10,000 people per day, which is the, the normal rate of death in Sub-Saharan Africa. And then we consider an emergency situation when you double that rate of death to one death per 10,000 people per day. And so just to highlight this again, that doubling of death normally comes from an increase in background diseases and outbreaks. And so we provide this food, water, and sanitation, measles vaccination, health care, and health surveillance. And the goal is to reduce this excess mortality by moving from what's called the acute emergency situation where everything is happening to the late emergency situation where, where things have started to recover to the post-emergency situation where things are back to this normal back rate of death. And this scheme is called relief to development. And the goal is, is this very linear process. And I think that's more ideal. The reality is much more complex because we often see emergencies cascading. Uh, Haiti is a good example of that. We have the earthquake, which we then have cholera after the earthquake. We have political violence after the earthquake. We have a hurricane coming in the middle of all of that. So in November of 2010, Haiti is still recovering from the earthquake 10 months ago. Cholera was introduced one month before. There's political violence going on, and there's Hurricane Tomas coming through. And that sense of it's not as linear to recover from emergencies as we might think, right? And so this changing framework of emergencies with the refugees constant but the IDPs increasing and with that population harder to access and care for, instead of seeing this kind of relief to development uh, goal, what we're often seeing is, is these really complex situations. And um, as Sudan is one example where um, 68 to 93 percent of the deaths were from violence in the acute emergency, and we saw crude mortality rates up to about 10 per 10,000 per day. So that's about 20 times the background rate of death. Um, and again, we see that in, within, even within the IDP camps, we're seeing significant violence causing death. Um, and then we also see entrapped populations like in DRC where there's just ongoing collapse of social structures. And so fever, malaria, diarrhea, malnutrition, uh, maternal and child health, childbirth, acute respiratory infection, all of those are accounting for greater than 50% of the crude mortality rate. Under five suffer the most from these deaths and account for about half the deaths. And of course, reductions in crude mortality rate are associated with reductions in violence. And there's estimates that there's been more than 4 million excess deaths in DRC due to the ongoing conflict there. And that's just deaths that if there had been these systems established, there wouldn't have been, um, there wouldn't have been those deaths. And so to move on to, to how, what's really the role for water and sanitation and hygiene and, and particularly household water treatment, which I work a lot on, within the emergency context, and there's two real spaces where, where WASH has a role. And the first is, is in outbreaks related to diarrheal disease, fecal oral transmission, such as cholera. Water sanitation and, and hygiene clearly has a role in those emergencies. And the, the other place that, that WASH really has a role that could impact and, and prevent the, the mortality, the deaths, is, is in natural disasters that lead to flooding or displacement, because we know that after flooding and displacement, we see mortality increase, right? And those, that's where interventions to reduce diarrhea can have a lot of impact. Now, in some complex emergencies or fragile states where the state is not providing water and sanitation services, that's another place where, where water might have a role. And so I want to highlight here, it's not that WASH has a role in every emergency. It's not like every person affected by emergency is going to get diarrheal disease or is going to get cholera. There is 
there is a strategy for here for how we respond, and this is a place for where there might be appropriate responses. So, so what do we do? Um, in emergencies and in development as well, we look at installing water supplies. We look at um, providing household water treatment options like this chlorine option. We look at um, isolating feces from the environment like this latrine, and we looked at the promotion of hand washing with soap. Those are the interventions we promote um, in development and in emergency contexts with water sanitation and hygiene. Within household water treatment, specifically point of use water treatment, which is what I'll spend the rest of the talk talking about, because um, I've done some research in that area in emergencies. In particular, we promote five different household water treatment options. So we have, um, we have ceramic filters, where the water flows through the filter into a, into a container. We have chlorine, either liquid tablet form. We have solar disinfection, where we put water in the roof and the combined synergistic effects of sunlight and, and UV inactivate the bacteria, viruses, and protozoa. We have sand filters, and we have a flocculent disinfectant. It's a commercial product that um, includes both a flock and a disinfectant. Right, so we generally have these options, and these options are used in both development, but they're often also handed out in emergencies. So the first project that we did at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine is we looked at a, a literature review funded by USA and CDC on um, point-of-use water treatment in emergency response. And the goals were to document the recent experiments, uh, recent experience of point of use water treatment in emergencies, and to identify lessons learned to guide operational research. And these goals were completed by conducting a literature review and an e-survey of implementers. And so one of the things I want to point out of the literature review, when we look at a variety of different products, you see really that um, of the, there's 37, there's 40 total documents identified looking at, at either household water treatment, point of use water treatment in emergencies, and 20 of those were on one commercial product, the commercial uh, flocculent disinfectant. So there's not a lot of research on household water treatment in the emergency context. And I particularly want to point out aqua tabs, which are chlorine tablets, which are very widely distributed. And there's almost no research. There, at the time of this review, there was no studies on aqua tabs in emergencies. And so some of the things that are most provided are not actually well researched. There's a, there's a gap there, whereas some of the things that are funded by companies are very well researched. And so there are huge research gaps in, uh, in, in emergency response work. And then I just want to summarize um, very quickly the results of this the report. I can provide the, the source file for this report. But um, the lessons learned that came out in this report were that household water treatment, point of use water treatment, can be effective sometimes in emergencies, but not always. That currently point of use water treatment projects do target high risk emergencies, ones where diarrheal disease risk is increased, such as flooding or displacement, but that products and not users dominate the option selection. People are, they have a product and they just give it out. They're not talking to users about whether the users want it, know how to use it, receive sufficient training, or it's appropriate for the local water quality. And that training is crucial to update, that you can't just hand these products out, you need to hand them out with appropriate training in order for them to work. And that logistics are super important. Things are distributed that are available in country before the emergency, that are registered in country, and that people have the materials to use. And the last thing we learned in this review was that chlorine dosage, which varies quite significantly, and needs to be considered and appropriate for the water quality. So there was a lot of research that was indicated from this review, including looking at the acute emergency situation right after emergency onset, looking at all household water treatment options, not just commercial ones, um, looking at behavioral determinants of adoption, looking at the relation to other water sanitation hygiene programs, looking at organizational decision making, and seeing if, if the emergency really did lead to to um, development use, longer term use. And just to highlight here, this is a, a, a um, kind of fact sheet brochure um, manual that I developed with the Red Cross and then talking about how to do option selection. It's a, it provides very simple information on the options available in emergencies and then when you might select them based on water quality, what you have access to. Etc. And I can also provide the original file for, for this document, which is in multiple languages and available on the Red Cross website. Um, so 
Then after we'd completed this literature review, we really wanted to move on to do the research that was needed. And we decided to have um, two research questions, and we were funded by UNICEF and Oxfam to answer what role, if any, should household water treatment, point of use water treatment, play in emergency response, particularly in the acute emergency context, and what are the factors associated with feasible and potentially sustained implementation of point of use water treatment in response to emergencies. And so what we did is we had an open protocol where we actually went into four emergency situations. And in each of those emergency situations, we evaluated, we went to households of people who received um, household water treatment products from any organization. So, for example, we'd go into an emergency funded by UNICEF and Oxfam, but we'd find out who had distributed household water treatment options within that emergency, and we would get the household or geographical information, and we would go to those households to see how they used or didn't use those water treatment products. And so it was an open protocol. It was open for a year. We didn't know what emergencies we were going to go to. And in the end, the four emergencies we went to were we went to Nepal for the cholera in August of 2009. This is an image from Nepal in the rural areas, and this is um, the cholera outbreak. We went to um, Pariaman, Indonesia, for the earthquake that occurred in 2009, October. This is an image of a household that, that came down in the earthquake. We went to Turkana, Kenya, where there was flooding, and this is a, the flooding that occurred. But there was also a cholera outbreak in January, February 2010. Um, just to give you a sense of the area, this is a home in that area. It's on the border of Sudan. It's quite remote. Um, and then lastly, um, the Haiti earthquake in February, March 2010, we went in and, um, and looked at all the household water treatment options that have been distributed in the Haiti earthquake. Now, we, had a, we did a mixed message. We did household surveys. We did key informant interviews. We did water quality testing at the household level. We, um, we looked at costing and, and logistics. Um, we looked at GIS mapping. So there's quite a bit of information that was gained. In each of, the, um, in each of these four emergencies, we, we looked at 400 households. Um, so we looked at, at 400 households, so a total of 1,600 households that had received product were evaluated. Now this is all the information, oh, let me get to the right slide here. This is all the information we gained um, from all four emergencies in one slide. And I'm going to kind of walk through this slide. Um, the emergencies are on, on the first column, so the Nepal, Indonesia, Turkana, Kenya, and Haiti. And then the actual household water treatment options that have been distributed by any NGO are in the second column. So in Nepal, uh, various forms of chlorine, either tablet and liquid, were distributed. And they were distributed by an NGO who stationed people in the affected cholera communities, and then they handed out these products. And, and one day you might get WaterGuard, or one day you might get Piche. UNICEF was providing the products as they could get them there. And so it wasn't like um, it, it was a where you could get a product for four weeks, you ran out, you might get a different product, but you had training on that from the people that were living in your community helping you use these products to prevent, to prevent, um, to improve your water quality to prevent cholera. So we need to add these numbers together because we visited households. And so about 30% of households we visited reported that they used the household water treatment option. They said, yes, in, that, in the water I have today, it is treated with this chlorine option. So about one-third of households reported using it. And I'm going to skip the confirmed uh, numbers in this uh, presentation, but if you go to the effective numbers, about 18%, that's 8 plus 7 plus 3, actually were using that option to take their water from dirty to clean. It meant they had dirty water and they were making it clean with this, with this option. So about one in three that were given these options in Nepal were reported using it, about one in five were using it correctly to make their water safe. Now if we go to Indonesia, we see a slightly different story. They were handing out liquid and tablet chlorine. Well, people really didn't like the taste of chlorine in Indonesia. The directions on the tablets were written in English. There was no training. There was no one to follow up. And, and people just didn't like it. And as you can see, there's very low reported use and no effective use. Now, boiling is, is widely used in, in, in Indonesia just regularly. And while it wasn't promoted by emergency response organizations, 88% of our respondents said they were using it, and 27% of re respondents had been moving their water from dirty to clean with boiling. And so what I, what I want to 
highlight here is that what should have happened in this emergency is that the emergency response organization should have helped people boil better, providing them safe boiling containers, providing them a, a safe storage container. But instead, they were promoting chlorine, which people didn't want to use. Um, Turkana, Aquatabs, chlorine tablets, and Pure were handed out in a in an emergency response non-food item kit distribution. So essentially a car came, you got a big box, it had some it had some pans and some crayons for your kids and some blankets and some and some chlorine tablets and some pure. But you received a very cursory training on these products. And then there was no one in the community to ask about afterward. And so as you can see, six to thirteen percent of people reported using these products, but very few people were using them correctly. Less than one percent could tell us how to use Pure correctly and they were actually using it incorrectly and, and just not seeing effective use. So this non-food item kit distribution led to very low use. And the last thing I'll talk about, and this is, and then I just have two more slides and I'll finish up, is, is in Haiti, which was a much more complex situation where we had lots of different distributions and we see filters distributed for the first time. In Haiti, Aquatabs were distributed in one program where they were just handed out no follow-up, and we see about 24% reported use and 15% effective use in that. But in another program, Aquatabs were handed out via a community health worker program to rural areas that didn't have access to clean water and had follow-up from local community health workers. And this was done by an organization that was in Haiti before the emergency and who had Creole materials. And this is where we see our incredibly high use, like 75 to 92 percent of people reported use and over half to two-thirds of people improved the water quality here. They got the training, the materials were in Creole, they had follow-up from local community health workers. Now with the filters that were distributed, we see very high reported use, 53 and 72 percent, but the um, effective use was lower and that's partly because with the ceramic filters, they were actually handed out to people who already had clean water. They were handed out to people living next to an airstrip and those weren't really the people that needed it. And with the biosand filters, we see a lower effective use because the people installing the biosand filters were affected by the earthquake and they made mistakes in their job afterwards. They were impacted. They didn't they were not able to perform their job as well because of that impact, and they installed the biosand filters incorrectly, and so they didn't work. And so this is a very complex set of information, but what I want to boil this down to is one slide, which is if you provide an effective option that actually works, to a population with actually unsafe water, we can't assume everyone in an emergency has unsafe water, and that population wants to use the product, is familiar with it, it's the materials are appropriate, they have the right training, that's when we see our effective use. That's when we see emergency response working really well. And so I think that we've done additional research in emergencies since this time, and I think this graphic remains true. I'm going to have one more slide here, which is essentially some thought questions about research in emergencies, which is what research is ethical to conduct in emergencies, what projects do you donate to, what is success in the emergency context, is one in two enough, is one in five enough? Um, how should money be tracked? How do you balance the ethic of humanitarianism, which has reached the most needy with scaling up? Um, how do we better apply lessons learned in the development context into emergencies? And how do we link emergencies and development? And I think these are questions that we still really are, are working on today, and this is where things are moving forward. And I'd like to end this presentation with um, one uh, quote, which is, the notion that being humanitarian and doing good are somehow inevitably the same is a hard one to shake off. And I'd like to comment that, that doing ethical research can help us align being humanitarian and doing good. Thank you so much for your attention. It's been great to speak, and I'm, I'm happy to take questions. I see a few questions here that I will um, go through, and, and feel free to, to type up your questions as, as you have them. Daniela, thank you. That was fantastic. Really, really good. Very, 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 very thought-provoking. And um, uh, well, I just did invite everyone to just, we've got some time, about 10 minutes or so, to uh, ask some questions. So please type some questions into the, uh, the, the Q&A box. We've got a couple of arriving already. But uh, I had a couple of thoughts on that because it was very thought-provoking and it, it really for me, uh, raised all sorts of issues around communication and uh, how communication and scaling up uh, promoting technology is, is very difficult 
in a normal situation, so in a humanitarian situation, it becomes 10 times uh, harder. And, um, and and I think your, the, the points you've made um, at the end there are really, really powerful because the number of organizations that have certainly approached us with what I call the magic boxes, these little things that can treat water to 0 0.000 nanograms per liter or whatever, and they're so fixated on the treatment side that they haven't really understood the human dimensions, and I think that's come out really, really strongly. Um, I guess one question I'd like to pose before I pick out some that have come in is, in the development context, household water treatment is, uh, is, is struggling to scale up in many regions of the world. There are lots of different organizations trying lots of different ways. But that there is a consensus around uh, sort of mar market-based approaches about uh, no subsidies that it's a, it should be a desirable product. So how how does that um, square with a humanitarian situation or or a complex situation where it's kind of like South Sudan, where it's kind of humanitarian working alongside long-term development, where you have some organisations trying to implement market-based approaches. And then you have humanitarian uh, organizations giving stuff out for free. Um, what, what's your experience with that, that tension? Yeah, and that's a great question. So, so humanitarian responses is almost by definition for free. Very, very few people think it's ethical to charge for, for any distribution in, a, in humanitarian response. But I would actually challenge um, a little bit your statement that there's, there's a consensus around market-based approaches for household water treatment. I think that there's a consensus around you need to look at the socioeconomic status of your recipient in determining which approach you use. So, for example, if we're looking at middle income or higher income people in developing countries, there is a consensus that it should be market-based, that people should be paying something for their, for their water treatment. But I think when we look at the, the lowest quintile, um, the bottom 20% 20 per, 20 in developing countries, I also think there's a consensus that those people should be, um, the, the provision can either be highly subsidized or can be provided for free. And so I think there's, there's, it's a more complex story of you're looking at the, the various, uh, the economic status of, of your user, uh, a middle income person in an in a urban area in India is going to be able to afford something quite different than, as you say, someone in DRC or Sudan. And so, it's it's a more complex picture, and, and as we say, as you say, I think we need to look at um, we need to really look at our end user um, in terms of what program we develop to reach them. And I don't see in humanitarian response attention like if you get something for free in, in an emergency, then it's potential you might pick that up and buy it afterward if you liked it. But there is attention in places like Haiti where there's been so much emergency response, people aren't willing to pay for anything anymore, even though they might be able to afford it, because they're just, I'll wait for the next person to give me free Aquatabs. Does that make sense? Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. And I just wanted to say I've seen a bunch of questions about if you'd like to, if you'd like the presentation, you can just email me, um, and I'm moving it back to the slide. That's my email address. So feel free to email me, and I'm happy to send the presentation. Um, I'm also happy to send research. So I see a ton of questions on can you send me this or can you send me this literature. Um, all of those questions I think are probably not best to answer in this forum, but just have me um, just send an email to this, and I'll, I'll send this off um, to you. Um, yeah. Great. Okay. Well, there's a question here from Mike Barbie who asks, uh, why have the sphere standards not been endorsed by the UN, though they're so prolific and used even by UNHCR in its work? So, so this actually it's a fantastic question, and the reason is the sphere standards are, are there, everyone uses them. We all know everyone uses them, but they are consensus-based standards. They are not evidence-based standards, and as such, the UN does not formally endorse them, and that's, that's the reason for that. Um, and then I also see a question here, wouldn't success be greater if populations were prepared and instructed in advance rather than reacting afterwards? 
Exactly. Disaster risk reduction, preparing in advance, we see that in Indonesia, that would be the ideal, is to have people know an option beforehand and then be able to use it afterward. That's what we saw in Indonesia with boiling, in Haiti with the chlorine program that worked really well with community health workers. It is people being prepared that allows them to um, to be able to be more resilient to um, emergencies happening. Unfortunately, that's not how the funding is allocated. Funding comes after an emergency with the response pouring in. There's not as much funding for risk reduction, and I think we do need risk reduction. Mm -hmm. and, what is that, and what's your experiences with how successful um, risk reduction has, has been outside these, these, these examples? And, you know, I think in Indonesia, which clearly sees and a, 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 Indonesia sees emergency after emergency. It's right on the ring of fire. There's a lot mm -hmm. going on in that in that country, and they've been able to establish long-term um, emergency response uh, uh, organiza uh, cluster meetings and and working groups. And so, for example, Indonesia has a document. These are the types of latrines we recommend that organizations coming in after an emergency build in Indonesia in order to make sure these latrines can be continued on after the emergency. And so they have fantastic preparation, fantastic planning. It's clearly because they're they're so often impacted. A challenge, of course, is there's these long-term working groups that, that make these documents, what latrines they recommend for Indonesia. Don't come in with your latrine from Rwanda. Use the ones that are appropriate for the toileting practices here. But then sometimes an organization will come in and they won't look at what's on the ground. And I think this is one of the biggest drawbacks of emergency response is we have um, people kind of, I call them cowboys, we have cowboys dropping in and they do whatever they did in the last emergency, whether or not that's appropriate for where they are, and don't look at what's on the ground. Because I think when you look at what's on the ground is when you have the most impactful programs. And that require, might require a little bit of culture shift in both the emergency and development response organization, but that's when we see impact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Now there's a good question here from Rivetti Fora about how can uh, one help by volunteering? Uh, because yeah, as you put in the last slide, it's this, this tension between yeah, doing good and, uh, and also do-gooders who end up getting in the way and actually causing a lot of headaches later on. Um, and, and Haiti is a great example of, of where everyone piled in and ended up in some cases doing more harm than good. So uh, what what advice can you give on how people can volunteer in a, in a, in a useful, practical way? Right. And I think one thing, and, and you raise really good points with Haiti, where uh, there was an expression in Haiti, um, blondes falling out of the sky, foreigners, white people falling out of the sky <laughs> after the earthquake was the expression in Creole. And um, and a lot of a lot of people did not help and there were people who flew in to help help build fences and I'm like you could have sent money and hired a Haitian who needs the money right now to build that fence does that make sense and yeah. so I think there is a sense one you can you can find an organization you trust that um, that does work that you know whether it be a local organization through your church or community that you know their work they're doing and and donate money or an international organization for example it's very clear if uh, if you're interested in, in Ebola response MSF and 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 IMC and Red Cross are doing fantastic care and treatment work right so you can look at, at those type of things but if you personally want to volunteer what I would um, what what I would say is develop a skill that you offer in collaboration with an organization that can place you such that that skill can be used. So if you're a, a, a doctor and you can provide medical care and you want to work with MSF, or if you're an accountant and you want to help you know, manage the money, because when these huge influxes of money come in, it's crazy to manage it all, right? So can you work with the NGO to help them manage their money? Or if you're an engineer, can you help working locally help um, design or, or repair buildings or, or can you help train people or write manuals? And I think one of the things I will say is always work with a, a reputable organization, be that the local government or the international government or your own government or, or a reputable non-governmental organization and, and bring a skill. Because often if, and I don't mean to sound rude, but if all you bring is your hands, it's better to hire some local person who needs that money more and have them use their hands. Does that make sense? And, and feel free to tell me I'm, I'm a little bit rude, but 
I and I this more gently, but um, but I think it's really the skills that are often needed, and can we transfer those skills locally? Yeah, I think that's yeah spot on. I'll, I'll totally agree. back you up on that one. Yeah, very much, very useful. Um, okay, we've got time for maybe one or two more questions. Uh, I'll just pick this one out from Alex Zand, who asks. Uh, can you tell a bit more why exactly the biosand filters in Haiti have failed to provide clean water? Is it more to to, to do with the technical lack of training, or uh, or is it the yeah was it was it? Um, this was actually yeah. they were literally installed incorrectly. They were installed. If you know biosand filters, you're supposed to have a standing water layer of about five centimeters above the sand. Um, and literally the, the people installing the filters were really emergency affected and they, they didn't have that, that standing water layer. The water came below the level of the sand was where the spout was put. And so it was literally a technical error in installation by emergency affected workers that led to the biosand filters not affect. You need that standing water layer to establish the smutsteca. If you don't have it, the smutsteca doesn't form, then you only get 60% bacterial reduction instead of 99%. And this, I think, highlights a key point of, of Often in emergencies, everyone around you is affected, and that impacts the work that you can do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Okay, so I would just pick up one last question. Well, it's kind of two related ones about um, from Steve asking, do you see large centralized purification systems being effective in emergencies? And um, are other methods of treatment considered um, I think it mentions around like reverse osmosis and and quite more technically advanced uh, methods than the household water treatment. Right, and and exactly this raises a good point because I only talk about household water treatment here, but there's I could do equivalent presentations for sanitation, for hygiene, for large water treatment, mm, no, and sure, yes. Yeah. People do tend to bring in. There's there's a huge movement to bring in what we call mobile water units um, that are these kind of treatment systems on a pallet, and then you can bring them in and, and they do the they remove the .001 micron blah blah yada butts and such. And I think there's a great paper and I can send it on if you email me I can send it on to people that review some of these these water treatment units these mobile water treatment units. And the end result is if they are complicated, which they most often are, they have a lot of filters, they have a lot of this, you need to send someone who's trained to both install it and operate it, but then you also need to realize that it's going to break down very quickly and without replacement parts, it's not going to be continued use. And so actually some countries have set, like Indonesia literally said, please do not send us any more mobile water treatments. We will not accept them into country through customs because people want to send these large units and and they don't often provide the necessary training, follow-up equipment and maintenance. Now, if you provide that necessary training, follow-up equipment and maintenance, you can have a lot of high quality water being produced and that's fantastic and you can get that distributed. But without that ongoing maintenance and equipment, it, it's, they're, they're, they're a little bit, um, they're a little bit dinosaurs that, that break down very quickly. And so there's a good paper um, from responders talking about which ones have worked well and which ones haven't that I can send on to people who are interested. Brilliant. Thank you. And, uh, yeah, so I think we're coming up to the top of the hour now. So uh, I know there's, there's still some more questions coming in, but I'm sure we'll uh, get around to we'll, – we'll do our best to get those answered. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Oh, uh, one, oh, I've got no request for one more question, so I'll pick out one more question. Um, yeah, what, how, what do you see as the future for emergency response? Let's go for that from Robin. Um, I think there is a huge push, and this is coming from USAID. It's coming from DFID, the UK equivalent of USAID. It's coming from all these organizations to get more evidence. And, and there's a couple questions I'm seeing on, on evidence to start doing the research necessary in emergencies to understand what is used, how people use it, what reduces the burden, what reduces risks. And doing research in emergencies to understand Right now, there's a lot of perceived wisdom. If you hand this out, people will use it. If you do this in this area, it'll work everywhere. Or it won't work everywhere. And to take that perceived wisdom and put data on it, like I presented here, and it's, it's very simple research, but it, it's, the conclusions are, are very solid and generalizable. And so 
there's a lot more work to do that research that's necessary. And um, there's some things uh, like R2HC, the, uh, the research for humanitarian context, all this is coming out. Um, and I think it's important that we get that evidence base. And then I think we will see more evidence-based decision-making. Uh, clearly, there is a role for emergency response. I think that's a mix of local governments, international governments, UN, NGOs. There's a lot of push toward coordination, which is, is the cluster systems of coordination is moving forward. But, um, but yeah, it's about how do we do better selection of what we do in emergencies. Brilliant. Okay, well, thank you, Diana. That's, uh, that's a fantastic presentation and uh, really, really insightful responses to all those uh, great range of questions. So thank you very much uh, for, for your time. And thank you to everyone that's uh, attended this webinar and uh, put in the very thoughtful questions. We didn't get to all the questions, but we'll uh, respond to those. And thank you very much for, to uh, Engineers for, for Change for uh, given this opportunity to, um, uh, to to host this, uh, just a reminder that next week's RWSN webinar is on uh, rainwater harvesting. Um, uh, but otherwise, uh, I'm looking forward to the next EFC uh, webinars uh, because if they're all as good as this one, then I, I will definitely uh, be uh, logging on regularly. So thank you very much for attending, and uh, I'll sign off. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>